This is Emsolation. Hello and welcome to this very special bonus edition of Emsolation. Today you're going to be hearing from my friend, the brilliant Santilla Chingepe. Santilla was born in Zambia and moved to Australia with her family when she was nine. She is an award-winning journalist, a documentary filmmaker, an activist, and just honestly one of the smartest, most brilliant people I know. I knew she'd be the right person to talk to, to help you and I navigate the current climate and help us be better allies. So I want you to sit back and I want you to take in with an open heart and mind the brilliant words of this amazing human. Santilla Chingaipe is an award-winning journalist and a documentary filmmaker. Her work explores migration, cultural identities and politics. Santi was born in Zambia and moved to Australia with her family when she was nine. I met Santi at an event on my birthday, actually, where we both had to present letters speaking the words we wish we'd said. I spoke about revenge on a boss who called me the C-bomb and Santi gave a smart, nuanced and thought-provoking analysis of Cardi B lyrics. And, you know, let's just say hers was very important and I'm really glad my daughters were there to hear her. Um, I left somehow trying to figure out how to trick her into being my friend and then the corona hit and I retreated under my weighted anxiety blanket. She joins me now. Santilla, thank you so much for being here. You're very welcome. You didn't have to trick me to be your friend. Do you know what sold me in you? It was your shoes that day on your birthday. You wore the best shoes and I was like, we could totally be friends. Oh, my God, I love that it's all it took. You're as shallow as I am about some things. Pretty much. (laughs) So, obviously, there's a lot of shit going down. My darling, you can say and that again. um, <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of shit going down. And I was actually, I've got a few moral compasses in my life, and Jamila Rizvi is one of them. And I was talking to her on the phone, and I said, I really realized that I've been a bad ally to people of color, and um, I want to do something about that. And she said, Well, you need to give your platform over to a woman of color, you need to, um, act on your words you need to be more proactive it's not just enough to not be racist and she was right and then I thought about who I wanted to speak to and you were the first person I thought of and Jamila agreed but then I was also conscious of coming to you because you're a black woman and then I'm just like coming to you because this is an issue that's affecting black people and I didn't want do you know what I mean I felt like is it okay that I've come to you to ask for your help and and, and advice um Yes, and, I'll, and I, the reason why I say yes is um, I do a lot of work in the anti-racism space. Um, a lot of my work explores these issues. Um, my work sort of explores these issues in the sense that how do we get, how do we get things to change? How do we get governments um, to enact policies that ensure that there are fairer outcomes for all of us? So it is a space that my work does occupy, and I'm happy to talk about it from the context of, you know, what my work explores. Absolutely. I think where I sort of draw the line is, um, you know, the personal kind of interrogation, you know what I mean? Like, you know, me having to explain why something is or isn't racist or, um, yeah, like that, that, that is a space that I don't occupy. I think that there are um, a lot of resources out there that are incredibly helpful for a lot of people that are on the journey, um, um, of allyship and it is a journey, you know, I think that, um, sometimes we have to recognize that it's, you know, we're never going to get to a point or you, or you can never get to a point where you fully know everything or you fully understand everything. I think we're constantly unlearning and, and, and relearning, um, what we know. Um, but in order for us to grow and in order for us, um, as a country as well to move forward, um, we have to confront these really dark parts of our history, and and I th- and and I, and I get it. It's it's not comfortable, and it's not a comfortable conversation that people want to have. Um, but it is important because things aren't going to change. You know, people. You know, there's a, there's a group of people that are incredibly tired and frustrated and angry and have lived with a lifetime of this pain and trauma, and um, it's just bubbling to the surface, and it will continue to. It's not going to go away until we address the underlying issues. And that's, and that's what's really going on. So I hope that answers your question about whether or not, you know, it was wise for you to um, call me up. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to be that white lady that it's just now, you know, like, oh, I've just realised. Like, oh, I've always been aware of 
I, I mean, racism in, in this country, I've never celebrated. I'm the daughter of an immigrant and I remember as a kid, my dad was born in Italy and I remember feeling awful about Australia Day. I never understood it. Like from even before there was any sort of debate on it, I just remember thinking, but not everyone can be a part of it, so why are we doing it? And I, um, I don't know, I just... I want to get this right, but I also don't want to. It's it's not your job as as a woman of color to tell me how to be a better ally. There's women of color and, and, and men of color and indigenous people have been doing work in this space for centuries. Mm. White people just haven't been listening and taking notice. And I think it's time that we do that. And your Instagram post yesterday stopped me in my f- tracks, like, uh, and it's something as a white person with my white privilege that I've never thought about in that. Can you talk a bit about how you alter yourself each day to make white people feel comfortable about who you are? Yeah, I mean, it's what you learn just from a very young age. You know, I, I, I think that there are a lot of a lot of black people, and by black identifying people um, here, I'm sort of talking about indigenous people as well as people of African descent, um, and and other people of color would also argue that that they too um, have to modify how they move in the world just to make um, white people feel more comfortable um, and also not to, you know, fall prey to, you know, racialized narratives around assumptions that people have of, you know, what black people might, might, might be like or what, you know, Asian people might be like or what Indigenous people might be like. And so it's something that you, you just become second nature, which is incredibly unfortunate and unfair. And, and this is also part of you know, the the bubbling anger and rage is that, you know, you'd like to think that your own children won't have to go through that, you know, that that, that it sort of ends with your generation. I mean, I, I certainly know that my parents thought that it would end with their generation. Um, but, you know, to come to your point about just how tricky it is as a white identifying person to navigate these conversations, I think Australia is in a very interesting place in 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 the world in that we have only come to this discourse probably in the last 10 years or so like adequately actually started to have these conversations actively started going we don't know enough we need to be talking about it um other places like the united states like the uk have been having these conversations for a little bit longer than us you know and what's forced us to have these conversations has been the internet because we're seeing these conversations happening globally and people here are going, hang on, it happens here as well. What are you going on about? But for so long, any time marginalised communities have tried to say something, it's been met with, you don't know what you're talking about. Or even worse, governments, for example, have been incredibly paternalistic with how they've treated specifically Indigenous communities you know, and how and how we talk about and how we address some of the injustices that happen to, you know, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander brothers and sisters. So it's, Australia's in a very, it's like we're in a unique context in many ways, but we're also very much connected to that very global conversation around race and racism. Yeah. It's interesting to hear people saying, oh, I'm so glad I live in Australia and what a lucky country we are. And even this morning, the Prime Minister said, oh, aren't we lucky to be here as though, you know, 400 Indigenous people haven't died in police custody since 1991 and not one police officer has been prosecuted. Like, it's so conveniently swept under the rug and I don't understand how we can continue to let that happen. I think we let it happen, you know, one, whenever we have conversations that sort of say, is this or isn't this racist, you know, like... The fact that we still deny racism exists is problematic. But politicians know what they're doing. You know what I mean? They're in the business of, Mm. you know, ensuring that they are in power. And they know that racism exists because they prey on it. And the reason why they prey on it is that we can have political leaders that are voted in on the platform of division and hate, right? And the only reason why those people are in those positions is because there are people out there that actually believe what they're saying, right? The question isn't so much for me, about denying whether or not racism exists. The question for me begins, how do we, as citizens that live in a democracy, as citizens that believe in fairness, equality and justice, ensure that that is something that every Australian, regardless of what their skin colour is, is afforded, you know? Mm. And we know that people are disproportionately affected in this country because of their race. You just have to look at the data 
whether it's with health, with education, with housing, you know, there are some groups that are being left behind and we have leaders that can actually address that. You know, these things can be fixed. That's the part that's really frustrating. Mm. So these things can be fixed, mm. you know, but instead we allow those that are powerful to convince us that the reasons why certain things are happening to us, whether it's our own economic inequality, is a result of those other people that don't look like us, yeah. right? Yeah. And so we continue to punch yeah. down and we pick a different group. You know, if it's not Indigenous Australians this week, it's the LGBTIQ community next week. It's refugees and asylum seekers the following week, you know, instead of punching up to the people mm. that are in positions of power that, ha- that can actually do the, 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 the change, you know, and ensure that there are policies in place that we don't, we don't continue to see a lack of accountability when it comes to Aboriginal deaths in custody. Mm. You know, you're right. I mean, how is it possible that since 1991, mm. since the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody, that there, there have been no prosecutions? The last time a police officer was prosecuted was in 1983. So, God, it's just grim. I took in all the writing and, and I took in all the commentary around it. And for me, I was like, yeah, I get it. I would, they're angry. They've had centuries of disempowerment and racism and enough's enough and then you've got people you know arguing the black lives matter hashtag which is what got me wild people saying no but all lives matter and it's like no that's not the point Mm. what do you say that that's always the argument you know it's also with the me too movement with the not all men you know that that idea that if you're championing one then you're forsaking others and that's not the case i saw it explained as if you're at a, a breast cancer rally you're not going to have someone lunging forward saying, but all cancers matter. Of course they do. That's, that's a given. We're not saying they don't. But at this point in time, black lives need to be pushed to the forefront and looked after because they're not. Do you, do you get frustrated at you know, that, that idea that we can't say black lives matter, that it has to be that all lives matter? I mean, I get where it comes from because at the heart of racism is power, right? And mm. it's the fear of the loss of that power. What does it say if we amplify black lives? Does it mean that I, I cease to exist? Does it, does it mean that, that what I think and what I feel doesn't cease to exist? But you're right. You know, these things aren't mutually exclusive. You know, you can no. care very equally about a cross-section of issues. You know, it doesn't take away from anything. It doesn't take away from your sense of being. But, you know, when we talk about whiteness as a political construct, just the same way that blackness is a political construct, whiteness is built on that position of Mm. being in the centre, of being in the centre where you're not having to have your worldview challenged or your perspective and you can move through life without that being questioned. And when someone goes, hang on, this life matters, it's misinterpreted as saying, well, you're not any less. And when you've been so used to being in the centre, it's a very difficult yeah. thing to listen to and it becomes very uncomfortable because it's like, what are, you, what are you saying to me, you know? And it's like no one's saying that your life is any less. All people mm. are saying is that for so long there have been so many injustices done to people based on their skin colour and they're saying enough and they're saying take a look and this is why you need to take a look. But I even, and I feel like I could be very easily guilty of this, white people putting themselves in the centre of the anti-racism movement. You know, it's, that's the natural place where we insert ourselves because, like you said, that's our privilege. We're so used to being there, but that's not our place. And I guess that's why I wanted to talk to you today because I want to be a part of empowering and being useful. I want to be useful, but I don't want to make it about me. So how do, how do we navigate that as allies? And, again, I'm conscious it's not your job to tell me how to be a good ally, but if you could point us in the right direction – that I think a lot of people listening today, and I know a lot of my community are feeling like I am, that the, the, the members who aren't people of colour are minorities. How can we be better? Conversations like this are a good start, mm. recognising that they're things that you don't know. Mm. And when you don't know, just allowing others that do know to speak, you know, just like in any, in mm. any context, you know. I sort of think about like, you know, when we talk about sexism and we try to get, you know, we're, we're trying to dismantle sexism, one of the important things, and there is an acknowledgement that in order for that to happen, you know, men have to be part of that conversation, right? Mm. Equally, for us to dismantle racism, we need everyone, part of it. And like I said, there are, there are, there are enough resources um, available for people to begin the journey 
of allyship, but it also goes beyond that. It goes, it goes, you know, it's the kind of conversations that you have at home, the kinds of conversations you have mm. with colleagues, the conversation that you have with your children. Um, mm. It's about who you're voting for, the people that you're voting for and the policy platforms that they represent. The same way as feminists, we, we, we argue that, you know, policies that, that impact women disproportionately should mm. never be supported. We should be doing the same when it comes to policies that impact Indigenous Australians and other marginalised communities. Yes. And it's that act of lobbying, you know, and people are doing it. I mean, you look at the Australia Day, uh, the Invasion Day rallies, for example. Mm. I mean, I've been to some of those rallies over the years and they're people from all walks of life, of all races. There is recognition that enough is enough. And that also is a useful way of showing solidarity the same way when we go out and we're, you know, calling for um, action and climate change, you know, it requires everyone from all walks of life to step mm. up. And that's all, mm. and that's all it is. It's just, you know, we, we however you recognise and, and see what you can do with what you have, some people have more power than others and I completely understand that. Mm. But it's just doing whatever you can within your community to ensure that you're not repeating past mistakes and that you're conscious of these things. That's all. Yeah. It will require people to be uncomfortable and have uncomfortable realisations about themselves and put the needs of other communities equal to their own. And I think that's the big kind of block for a lot of people is, and like you said, we're now able to curate our existence and surround ourselves with like-minded people online and make ourselves feel good all the time and like we're right all the time because we've, we've curated this echo chamber of agreements. And when things kind of step in, and, and I'm guilty of it, but I've just created this little left-wing bubble where everyone's holding hands and getting along and everyone's equal and that's... America happens and these images hit me and I realise I'm f***ing wrong. I'm, I'm in denial. I'm in as much denial as the people who, who are saying there isn't racism. I need to do more. And, you know, what you just said to me, of course I need to look into the people I'm voting for and what their record is on Indigenous health and treatment and incarceration and education and... You're so right, Santi. It's just not something that's ever made obvious. I think it's, look, like I said, it, this is a journey, right? Mm. This conversation is as hard for me as it is for you. But there are many ways that we, we can show um, our solidarity in many ways, you know, mm. whether it's backing organisations, corporations that centre marginalised communities, you know, that don't profit off of those. I mean, even even just those little things that we do in our daily life, the same way that we we show our support, you know, for various movements based on how, based on our purchasing power, you could do the same when it comes to racism. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you can, you can, you, yeah. you can do the same. And it's, it, like I said, it's never ending. It's not, it's not something that, you know, you do once and you're like, okay, I've done it. And therefore, you know, that's it. It's, it's being mindful of it and, you know, people get it wrong. We all get it wrong. We're flawed human beings, but it's trying. That's all you can do. You, you try and you try again and you just keep trying and hopefully, you know, when our children are our age, they don't have to be having these sorts of conversations. They can be having conversations about other things. Do you think that's possible though? Like, do you think by the time our kids are our age... No, because, like I said, I work in the anti-racism space. So for me, racism is more than just good versus bad. And I think that's probably where a lot of people get stuck. It's this idea of um, yes. I'm not racist, I'm not a bad person, and if I say yes. something racist, that makes me a bad person. It's like racism is not about good or bad. You can be good-intentioned and do racist things. Mm -hmm. Equally, you can be someone that is male-identifying and perpetuate misogyny, for example, and not even be yeah. aware of it. So these things can happen, but from an academic sense, racism can sort of be broken down into three different forms, right? So you've got yeah. the racism that a lot of people are very aware of, which is the overt racism, right? The lynchings, slavery, mm -hmm. calling people racial pejoratives, racial slurs, that sort of discrimination, that is what a lot of people mm -hmm. seem to identify as racism, and it is a form of racism. And some people go, well, I don't do that, so therefore I'm not racist, right? Then there's another mm -hmm. form of racism, which is known as implicit bias. And this implicit bias is also known as unconscious bias. 
And this is when we take on racialized narratives that have mm. been born through... So to give a context of how racism came to be, racism was born out of slavery, and I know this because I'm writing a history book at the moment, um, was born out of slavery um, during the transatlantic slave trade. So when Europeans were buying and selling human beings to justify that inhumane act of this economic system that was building the new world, narratives were created, narratives around inferiority and superiority, right? And to keep these people enslaved, the Bible was used. There were certain aspects of the Bible that were used to justify that. But also, you know, narratives around physical appearance, narratives around black people, you know, not being inferior and all that sort of stuff started to form. And unfortunately, those narratives haven't left us, right? They've continued mm. to this day. So that is where, and that's why, you know, racism is a system. It was created. It's not, it's not real. It's not, you know, what makes me black is, there's nothing, <laughs> you know. Yeah. I just, I just, I, I look black, but, there's, but that's it, right? Mm. But, the, but the beliefs mm. that someone can have about someone like me and what they think I might be or do or, or whatever, that's where unconscious bias comes in. So when you are someone that is uh, an Indigenous Australian, for example, or if you are black and you show up and present at a hospital in this country, for example, your level of treatment might be different to someone that's white. And this, is, this happens because this is how um, unconscious bias shows up, right? And so mm-hmm. The, mm-hmm. your outcomes, your health outcomes are impacted based on this unconscious prejudice that's going on. When someone applies Mm. for a job and they're dismissed based on the fact that their name is not anglicised and there are all these assumptions Mm. that are based on that, that is unconscious bias. And then the third form of racism is institutional racism or systemic racism. And this is when institutions perpetuate racialized narratives. So whether it's in the criminal justice system where you see an overrepresentation in this country, for example, of Indigenous Australians whether it's in the health system, whether it's in housing, whether it's to do with education outcomes. You know, you find that these institutions, for lack of will, for lack of wanting to, Mm. refuse to change how they work and how they treat people accordingly and recognising that people are coming to these uh, systems uh, at different points. But But the default is always is always whiteness. Mm. So everyone else is measured to that standard and it's never equal because we never start equally. We, we should have moved beyond that point. <laughs> you know, it's like, let's talk about how, how do we now start seeing institutional mm. change, you know? And this, is, mm. and this is what's taken people to the streets in, in the United States. Why is it that some mm. people are held to a certain standard and others aren't? And this is why people are angry because people just keep getting away with it. It's like, how is it over and over again? How does this not swallow you whole? Like, you're so driven and passionate and constantly trying to educate and contribute to this space when I feel like I would have just been like, F- you ignorant assholes. How does it not eat you alive? Oh, I have moments when I have my own breakdown. <laughs> it's not like I'm not, a, I'm not a human being, you know. I mean, this weekend was, was, was pretty heavy for me. But hmm. I'm also very aware that I live a very, very blessed and in many ways privileged life and that I think that's something that people might not necessarily think is possible for you know uh someone that's black that you you can also have privilege and and, and I do in many ways um but I know that my life is a result of people before me that chose to say something that decided to do things Mm. to change things and move things forward and so I see it as a responsibility to ensure that in my lifetime I do all I can with what I have and what I have is what I, what I do with my work, you know, how do I use words, how do I use language, you know, to move these conversations forward. And it is incredibly frustrating because the, the rate at which we're moving forward is incredibly slow. I, I know that I'm benefiting off the work of ancestors of all backgrounds that work to ensure that, you know, me and you can be sitting across from each other and having this conversation. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. so it just, yes, it's frustrating. Yes, it's hard, but I'm also very aware that my life is blessed in, in so many ways and because of that, it's it's a responsibility and, and it's something that I take very seriously and that's that's how I get through it. You're so incredible and I thank you very much for bothering. You didn't have to. Um, 
but I do want to be better and I'm on a journey of allyship and I think a lot of people listening today will also be joining me. So I'm just glad that you're there in the space, taking up space, making us smarter and better humans. Thank you for doing it. Thank you for speaking with me and um, you're a f-ing good human, Sandy. You really are. I'm going to keep picking at you and trying to make you my proper friend. And <laughs> well, I, I feel like I already am. I mean, why are we debating this? No, you are. are we still you're debating my friend. This? You're my friend. <laughs> no, we're not debating. You're definitely my friend. Um, it was good. I'm glad. I'll stop sweating. And, um, yeah, we'll talk soon. And um, keep doing what you're doing, man. I'm just glad you're doing it. Thanks, Santi. Bye. Well, that's it. I hope you got as much out of that chat as I did. Santilla asked me to mention that she also did a great series uh, for the Wheeler Centre about how racism manifests itself in Australia. It's called Not Racist But. And if you just Google Santilla, S-A-N-T-I-L-L-A, Jingaipe, C-H-I-N-G-A-I-P-E, and Not Racist But the series will come up. But I encourage you to consume everything that she has made. Her short films are beautiful and poignant, as is she. I want to thank Santilla for joining me again. I want to thank you guys for taking the time to listen. And um, I'll hear you guys soon. Thanks. Bye.